bridging the gap between the army and the civilian populace. Plus, a lifeline for vulnerable families, the Minister of Education joins forces with the World Food Programme to deliver take-home rations rather for families of children who relied on school meals before the closure of schools. In the internationals, Beijing officials warn against complacency on COVID-19 prevention and control as the city continues to battle a recent surge in coronavirus cases. Elsewhere in Afghanistan, the COVID-19 pandemic greatly affects the Kuches, who are among the poorest and most marginalized groups. All that and much more coming ahead on news at 10 p.m. with me, Fatou Elika Maloshi, and thanks for joining us. Everyone, welcome to the news. I am Fatou Elika Maloshi presenting. Now we begin this bulletin with a major humanitarian effort to end the escalation of child labor despite legislation banning the practice. Child labor continues unabated across the country with inner city locations becoming new grounds for socioeconomic activity for children who are supposed to be in school. Ahmed Lamisane finds out how right activists are addressing the growing number of children venturing into street business. Despite legislation banning of the practice, child labor continues unbated across the country with inner city locations becoming new grounds of economic activities for children who are supposed to be in school. A walk or drive along the highways in the Greater Banjul area takes you close to this menace, which has become a challenging burden for commuters, drivers and vendors who often have to find ways to get these children out of harm in the middle of traffic. In the thick of a business day in the city, a growing number of children are seen selling in the streets. The picture vastly contradicts legislative efforts and ongoing advocacy programs against child labor by right activists who are now questioning the effectiveness of their tactics. When you look at such practices, you realize that, well, this is something that is prohibited, but why is it still happening? And then this, the, 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 the number of children on the street, whether they are begging or they are selling, is on the increment. So which means when well, you have a well-intended law that prohibits this practice, but yet it is happening, then the question mark is, what is the duty we are doing about it? The increasing use of children as sales agents representing parents and guardians who somehow fail to invest in their development is a social phenomena needing more investigation. Statistics shows that Families involved are either unsettled migrants or local households lacking means to take their children to school. The trend has become a major cause for concern with authorities and child protection advocates fear that children venturing into the streets can be exposed to exploitation. The laws are there, they are very nice, but how do we make sure that they are, they are also implemented? So as an organization, our role is to complement government efforts. Uh, everything that we do is complementing government efforts in ensuring that children are not in the streets. They are somewhere that is more helpful. So we, we, we operate a child sponsorship program where we currently we are in supporting about 16,000 children. For child protection groups, the roadmap is rather clear. Laws that criminalize child labor needs to be effectively enforced to stop street vending. Stakeholders are putting up strategies to end child labor by setting up a special tax force committee in response to street selling activities by children. But also to what is important uh, for us still now, because we are civil society organization, that must complement, but also to we might, might always have to uh, inform the government as to its responsibility, because yes, law enforcement is one, but law enforcement would not be the final solution to the problem. No, because you have, most of these young people come from the less privileged background or families. So our advocacy still is about enforcing law, but also to, it becomes the primary responsibility of the state to also support these families that are less privileged so that they are able to help this, this, this to able to uh, improve on their living of standard and then they will be able to make sure that these kids are off the street. Almost every day or every week, 
you will see a story about a child being raped or being subject to something else. And yet still we have these laws that are there to protect these children. So what we do at Child Fund is to make so we promote the establishment of a coordinating force that will engage government. So we set up this what we call the CSO Advocacy Working Group and identify all these issues. And then the advocacy group meets quarterly to look at all the issues that are going on in country and how do we place them for government. Seen here in the full glare of our cameras, this has now become a daily routine for many children along the Banjul Brikama Highway and other busy city centers selling fruits, water and other basic needs. The question now is, what will authorities do to protect children and stop parents and guardians from sending their children onto the streets? Modula Sane, GRTS News. Now, as part of government's uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, in partnership with the United Nations World Food Program, will provide take-home rations for families of children who are receiving meals at school before their institutions were closed. Education Minister Claudiana Cole made the announcement during a press briefing at MOPSIS Conference Hall in Banjo. Changetere was there. The pandemic has affected the global education system, leading to a near total closure of schools, universities and colleges. To this effect, most governments around the world, including the Gambia, have temporarily closed all learning centers in an attempt to contain the spread of COVID-19. While having concerns about the well-being of children, the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, in collaboration with the local education group, and the World Food Program is set to provide take-home rations for families of children who were receiving meals at school before their institutions were closed. The distribution of this ration will begin in the North Bank region on 30th June and will later be rolled out in the Upper River region, the Central River region, Banjul and Kanifeng municipalities, West Coast region and the Lower River region. Each family of the beneficiary school mills prior to the school closure will receive two months worth of food ration including rice and oil. More than 200,000 children from the lower basic schools across the country are expected to receive the support which is expected to kickstart on June 30th. This was disclosed by the Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, Claudia Nicole, during a press briefing. It may interest you to note that nearly 240,000 children are expected to receive the support, with MAPSI assisting more than 88,400 children in two regions that is West Coast region and the Lower River region. And WFP will serve 151,742 children in the four regions. That is the North Bank region, Upper River region, Central River region, Banjul and Kanifeng municipalities. Wanja Kaira the representative and country director of the United Nations World Food Program commended MOPSI for their strong collaboration. She noted that the activities are all geared towards supporting the government of the Gambia to achieve its food security initiatives and the prevention of malnutrition. World Food Program provides life-saving food and nutrition assistance to vulnerable households. Nonetheless, school feeding program remains our largest program and the largest social safety net in the Gambia. That is why MOPSI and WFP will concert efforts to support a total of 240,000 children, 54% of whom are girls, and this will be in 542 lower basic schools across the country. It could be recalled that 
On May 17th, President Barrow, while addressing the nation on the status of COVID-19, declared a state of emergency in which all schools and educational institutions were closed as a means to protect children from the spread of COVID-19. Jenke Ture, reporting for GRTS News. Now, after years of alleged misconducts and extrajudicial performance during the former regime within the Gambia Armed Forces, the new military chief is moving to rebrand the image of the military by bridging the gap between the army and the civilian populace. Asatuketa takes an extensive look at the army and moves taken by the new chief of defense staff. This is the beginning of a new working day at a Gambian military barracks. Troops ready to take up their responsibilities for the day as assigned by their superiors. Highly structured and well organized. The Yundum barracks is one of the biggest military camps in the Gambia. We just established its first ever armed forces in 1984 after the field forces with a new name, the Gambian National Army. Since then, the army has developed into one of the most important institutions in the country with a constitutional mandate to protect and defend the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Gambia. An important institution which has barracks and military posts across the country and dedicated personnel ready to defend the Gambia at all costs. The army and security apparatus have seen significant improvements in both numbers and operational capacity. From medics to cooks, sentrymen and drivers, their engagement varies in the diverse disciplines and specializations ultimately designed to strengthen national security. The Army is also a creative and intellectual institution where education, sports and recreation and art is highly espoused and encouraged. That is why, among other departments, GAF still maintains one of the most competitive top-tier football teams in the Gambia. Gender awareness has become a vital policy that has reshaped the military's outlook with vastly dedicated women whose roles and responsibilities are not distinguished from their male counterparts. Women such as Colonel Jenna Basane, the commander of the Kudang Barracks, exemplify an ever-growing number of female senior officers holding key positions in the military. The military has had its high and low moments over the years, with many still fuming over its role in the country's previous regime. Involvement in politics, human rights violations under an extrajudicial misconduct have greatly tainted the image of the military which is struggling to emerge from its dark history under the country's former regime. Its current leadership seems highly committed to the full implementation of ongoing transformations under the security sector reform process. The Gambia Armed Forces is undergoing massive transformation to re-establish itself as the professional and brave forces it has always been known for on the continent. And demand spearheading the effort to win back public trust and confidence is the country's top military chief. We should not allow once again emotions and sentiments to override common sense and good judgment. That's my position. And perhaps I would like to emphasize on that issue. The armed forces we want to be seen as the people's armed forces. One way we're trying to do is how do we collectively work in bridging the gap between the military and the civil populace. In the midst of the current security sector reform of which the army remains central, one of Major General Drama's main strategies is to build a vibrant civil military relationship and this was amply manifested during the top general's nationwide tour of military facilities and troops around the country. For GRTS News, this is Isa Tukaita. Now, the Sukuta Karabai Youth Association on Saturday embarked on a massive cleansing exercise along the Sukuta Sarakunda Highway. The voluntary cleansing service, as Famarabaji reports, is earmarked to enhance sanitation and hygiene in the area. The voluntary cleansing exercise, according to the members of Sukuta Karabai Youth Association, is conceived to maintain sanitation and hygiene as well eradicate the spread of diseases such as malaria. The exercise was simultaneously done with the filling of potholes along major roads to avoid the presence of stagnant water, 
which pose threat to motorists and other road users during the rainy season. The chairperson and public relations officer of Sukuta Karaba Youth Association, Bakari Mani and Keba Bojam, respectively, highlighted the importance of community service. They both emphasized the need for collective and sustainable management of the environment. This is going to be a continuous thing because from here we have a lot of projects ahead for the village. That is, we are targeting the, 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 the toilet at the most to make it as a standard toilet. Working with uh, the BBC of the village, we are directly under them. Any development area comes, whosoever ever invited this organization for any voluntary help, we are welcome. This is the fourth Saturday uh, since we began on this cleaning exercise on the Sukuta uh, Serekunda Highway. As you can see, rainy season has already begun. So we want to make sure um, we, we embark on this exercise so that we will, we will be free from getting malaria or all sort of sickness. The youth are very ready. They are very ready to clean this environment, especially this uh, motorist highway. This will be doing this um, monthly and then we'll go into other areas. We will go into other areas where you have this drainage and other um, um, petty things on the road. Members of Sukuta Karaba Youth Association since the early days of June have so far cleaned a distance of about two kilometers along the Sukuta Serekunda Highway while planning to expand their services to Sukuta Central Mocks and other public places within Sukuta. Farmer Abaji, GRTS News. We now head to LRR, where UNESCO NATCOM The Gambia has handed over radio equipment to the Soma Community Radio. The equipment, courtesy of the Islamic World Organization, Scientific and Cultural Organization, and Mohammed bin Salman's MISC Foundation, included a transmitter, two wall fan, an air conditioner, and a laptop. Our regional correspondent in LRR, Alajimbai, has the details. Radio communication is believed to be the fastest and widest means of information dissemination. Soma Community Radio in the Lower River Region is the first UNESCO-funded radio station in the Gambia, established in 2007 to serve the communities of Lower River Region and beyond. This support, according to Ibrahim Ajiba of UNESCO, is part of a series of supports to the radio since its inception. I want to ask the management committee and the people of LRR, our continuous participation based on the mutuality of ensuring the realization of achieving the purpose of purpose for which the radio was established. That is, serving as the voice of the voiceless and raising awareness of people on important, com on com important contemporary, contemporary development issues, such as education, health, agriculture, women and youth empowerment, etc. Keba Dabo, Deputy Governor of Lower River Region, expressed hope that the donated equipment will improve service delivery and access to the community radio. This has been a challenge in the community radio, and today your noble institution is helping us to overcome our problem. This transmitter will enhance service delivery and many will be able to receive information with your support across the region. I would like to take this opportunity to challenge the management to maintain the equipment so that it can serve the purpose. As the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education delivers media lessons amid the coronavirus pandemic, the Principal Education Officer at the Regional Education Directorate in Mansakonko, Musaba, said the transmitter will ease lesson accessibility challenges faced by school children in the area. COVID-19 has brought new dimension to teaching and learning, and Regional Education Directorate 4, in partnership with Soma Community Radio, have been doing their best to provide alternative measures to teaching and learning through the creation of digital education content and delivering it via radio transmission. It is without doubt that we have been faced with challenges in the delivery of education content, but the provision of this state-of-the-art equipment 
will greatly enhance the production and delivery of education content as we continue to deliver uh, to live with COVID-19. Soma Community Radio Management and staff thank the donors for what they described as a timely gesture. The transmitter was installed immediately to boost wider coverage of the radio station, alleging by GRTS News. We'll now take our first break, and when we return, we'll look at news from outside the Gambia. Do stay. Still on the news, Beijing officials have warned against complacency at a press conference on COVID-19 prevention and control on Saturday. As the city continues to battle a recent surge in coronavirus cases, CGTN has more on that. The situation regarding the epidemic in the capital is severe and complex, and we should not take it lightly. According to case analysis, epidemiological surveys and transmission tracks since the cluster was identified at the Xinfa wholesale market, the industries, scenes, personnel, channels and symptoms involved are complex and diverse. Anyone's carelessness may cause new problems. Any environment or goods polluted by the virus may bring about a new spread. Beijing reported 17 new cases on Friday, mainly in the Feng Tai district, which is southwest of the city centre. They're related to the Sinfadi wholesale market, which is at the heart of the latest outbreak. Four asymptomatic cases were also reported. The city is now requiring staff at beauty and hair salons to get tested for the virus. Now, the Kuches are among the poorest and most marginalized groups in Afghanistan. Since COVID-19 hit Afghanistan in mid-March, it has greatly affected the livelihoods of this community. The lockdown imposed by the Afghan government was meant to limit exposure to the virus, but for the Kuches, that means giving up their livestock business and trade of dairy products. Let's follow this detail from CGTN. Afghanistan. Afghan nomads like the Kuchis had a tough decision to make, get sick or go hungry. To stop the spread of the virus, many Afghan provinces impose stringent lockdown measures. But for the one and a half million nomadic Kuchis, it provided a greater danger. The nomads are amongst the poorest and most marginalized groups in the country. They make their living by herding sheep, goats and camels. But the restrictions meant no spring herding and stopped all market trading, which meant the Kuchis had no income and a shortage of food. Continuing to herd and breaking the lockdown meant increasing their chances of being exposed to the virus. And as many of them cannot read or write, access to information about COVID-19 was extremely difficult. When COVID-19 hit back in March, the Community Livestock and Agriculture Project, known locally as CLAB, stepped in to help. Jointly funded by the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD, and the Afghan government, they trained up local field workers and vets to teach the tribe about protecting themselves from the virus using pictures instead of words. They provided hygiene and health safety kits, including masks and soaps, to 48,000 Kuchi families. <laughs> Living in remote regions, decades of conflict and drought have destroyed the nomad grazing areas and increased animal diseases in their herds. Since 2015, the CLAP project has been working with the Kuchi community across seven provinces, helping to strengthen animal health 
and improve food security for 50,000 poor households. They have trained up people to carry out basic veterinary procedures on the herds and teaching the coochies how to improve their animal feeds. Working with the coochies has seen the mortality rate in the livestock cut by half, improving the health and welfare of the tribe. Helping the Kuchi not only benefits the nomads, but the whole of Afghanistan. Afghanistan has extended its lockdown for a further three months, posing a huge threat to the nomads' health and livelihoods. Afghanistan has reopened some markets, but they are too far for many of the nomads to travel to. The project is now helping the tribe shift production, from milk to longer-lasting products like ghee, a clarified butter, that can be sold when more markets reopen. With the new product to sell, the Coochies hope they will be more resilient to future crises. This is GRT's News. A quick look at our top stories before we take leave of you. Signaling primary duty bearers, child right activists have called on government to enforce legislation on child labor. The chief of defense staff, Gambia Armed Forces, is moving to rebrand the image of the military by bridging the gap between the army and the civilian populace. Plus, a lifeline for vulnerable families, the Minister of Education has joined forces with the World Food Program to deliver take-home rations for families of children who relied on school meals before the closure of schools. In the internationals, Beijing officials have warned against complacency on COVID-19 prevention and control as the city continues to battle a recent surge in coronavirus cases. Elsewhere in Afghanistan, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected the Kuches, who are among the poorest and most marginalized groups. That was all in this edition of GRT's News. Thanks for the pleasure of your company and from myself and the entire news team. We're wishing you all a good evening. Stay safe. Coronavirus to Lola, Tangarabi Academy.